everybody. Guess where we are? That's right. We're in Miss J's kitchen. And yes, I have a whiteboard in my kitchen. We are about to watch uh, approximately after 30 minutes of review. I'm going to go through five different scenes to cover all of the material using this one chemical reaction. But to keep you interested, we are going to do a little bit of intermission between each scene. And your intermission entertainment will be provided by the man, the myth, the legend, if I die, Victor. I'm a legend, I'm a first, I'm on tour, got a grushy front of side. Okay, so the very first thing we're going to do is we're going to take this chemical reaction and we're going to describe it. And describing the chemical reaction is the first step to really understanding what you're doing. So, let's take this descriptive sentence of a chemical reaction and put it in a chemical equation. Lithium solid is going to be Li, and we're going to put an S here to indicate it's solid, reacts with water, which is H2O, and since it doesn't say anything else, we're going to, know, we're going to assume it's liquid, to produce lithium hydroxide, which is a polyatomic ion, that's OH. Now, to make sure we wrote the right chemical formula, you need to make sure your charges are balanced. So, for instance, because lithium is in group one on our periodic table, we know that they lose one electron to become stable. That's a one positive charge. Hydroxide is going to be on your list. If you'll find hydroxide, it'll have its charge right next to it. It is one negative. So, I only need one hydroxide for every one lithium. Now, it does indicate that this is a solution, which means we need to put an AQ right here. Now, it says it also, in addition to this making a solution, it also produces hydro hydrogen gas, H2, and we're going to put a G right here. Now, we put a 2 next to hydrogen because it's one of the seven nonmetals that forms diatomically when it's by itself. Okay, now, next, another thing that you want to that confirms that this was a chemical reaction, that a chemical change occurred, is the fact that we did produce a gas. So if we were in the lab and we were doing this experiment, we would actually see the hydrogen gas form. Now, also, in addition to that, we can talk about what type of reaction this is. What type of reaction is this, Victor? This is a singular displacement. Okay. It's a single displacement, Victor. Um, okay. Now, Let's balance the chemical equation. Now, in order to balance the equation, you need to list how much you, how many atoms or how much of each element is represented on both sides of the equation. So I've got lithium, hydrogen, and oxygen. Now there's one lithium on this side, one here, two hydrogens here, and then one plus two more, that's three here. On this side, I have one oxygen, and then only one oxygen, okay? Now, the only thing that seems unbalanced or is unbalanced is the hydrogen. You've got to fix that. Now, notice how the hydrogen is in two places over here. Remember, we don't mess with those. It can be dangerous and it can be very frustrating if you try to fix it that way. Yes, so let's put, let's put hydrogen, let's fix hydrogen on the reactant side. Okay, so we're going to put a 2 right here. That's going to make this 4. 2 times 2 is 4. And then over here, I, I'm going to save this over here. I'm going to try to fix the hydrogens that's in combination. So I'll put a 2 right here. When I do that, starting with my lowest coefficient, which is 2, that's going to change my lithium to 2, my oxygen to 2, and then it changes the hydrogen to 2 plus the other 2, so that's 4. So I balance the hydrogens. Now I need to fix, um, oh, I forgot. I did move this up to 2 when I put it in front of the water. All right, so now we need to fix the lithium. We'll put a 2 over here. Now it is officially balanced. When you have a balanced chemical equation, you create a proportion that makes mass equivalent on both sides of the chemical reaction. First, start talking about the little things, starting from the smallest unit of matter, which is an atom, and talking about what is inside that atom and how it relates chemically to the behavior of any element. Now, lithium is one of the elements involved in this chemical reaction. It is not stable by itself, and that's one of the reasons why it reacts so well with water in this reaction. Now, lithium has an atomic number of three. It is the third element in the periodic table. It has atomic number three, which means it has three protons, and since it hasn't bonded with anything, it hasn't lost, gained, shared electrons, that means that it has three electrons, three negative charges as well. Now, inside of its nucleus are protons and the neutral neutrons. There's four of them, okay? Now, lithium 
can be represented by a number of models, but the most common, one of the more accepted models still today, is the Bohr model of the atom. Now, you can see, and this is much larger than a nucleus really is, but you can see the protons and neutrons inside. Now, Bohr was the father of energy levels. He said that electrons weren't just orbiting outside the nucleus, that they were orbiting in specific energy levels around the nucleus. So the further out you get from the nucleus, the more energy that those electrons have. Now, you can tell from this drawing that it has one valence electron. Valence electrons are those that are involved in chemical reactions and in bonding, and they are located on the very outer energy level. Now, another way of knowing is by knowing the trend that goes across the table. Group 1 has one valence electron, group 2 has two, so forth and so on. Now, lithium, in order to become stable, will lose its one valence electron. So group 1, which are the alkali metals, lose their one valence electron for stability. And that's why, in addition to losing one valence electron, that's its charge as well. It's one positive. It is a cation. Okay, so we established that lithium gives away its one valence electron to become stable, thus becoming a cation. Noted here, it is a part of the group, uh, the alkali metals, it loses its one valence electron. It becomes positively charged because if you'll look, now it has three protons, positive charges, to only, once it loses this, only two negative charges. So it's up by one positive charge, and that's why it's one positive now. Now, if you'll also note that lithium, its mass reported on the table in all the elements is a decimal. What's that about? Well, the reason why that is, is because elements exist as isotopes. Now, lithium, two of its isotopes is lithium-6 and lithium-7. Now, I can say with confidence that lithium-7 is the more common isotope because the mass is closer to 7 as a whole number. So, what is an isotope? Victor? An isotope, it, uh, isotope, isotopes are some elements with a different number of neutrons, therefore having different... Atomic masses. Thank you, Victor. So as he said, elements that have different neutron counts in the nucleus affect the mass, since all the mass, mass is packed into the nucleus. So lithium-6 has only three neutrons, whereas lithium-7, the more common isotope of lithium, has four. Now let's venture to the other side of the table and the other side of the reaction, I guess, up here. Oxygen, and talk about oxygen for a section. Oxygen is a non-metal, making it very different than lithium. Now, oxygen has eight protons, and its mass is around 16. So we can say that oxygen 16 is the most common or most, or the isotope in the greatest percent abundance, which is true. Now, it has six valence electrons because it is in group 16. It's a part of the oxygen family. It is the head of its family. And it loses, or excuse me, it gains two electrons to become stable, unlike Lithium. If you'll take a look at this Bohr model of oxygen, oxygen has one, two, three, four, five, six valence electrons. And because of that, it gains two. Does it make sense to lose all six? It makes more sense to go ahead and gain two more to become stable. Now, you'll notice that I've got EC written right here and right here. This is where we're going to talk about something called electron configuration. Each element has its own unique electron configuration and is based on a set of quantum numbers. Now, understandably, S is not a number, it's a letter, but they call that a quantum number. Now, you'll see that the ground state electron configuration for lithium is 1s2, 2s1. There's the first two electrons here, and there's that last one, that valence electron. But lithium is not stable by itself, so it bonds and loses that one valence electron. So once it does, it becomes ionized, and its new ionized electron configuration is 1s2. Now, um, over here, we've got the ground state configuration for oxygen. 2 plus 2 is 4 plus 4, that's 8. That's the 8 electrons total. Now, it gains 2 electrons for stability, so it changes, and its ionized electron configuration is 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. Note that the ionized version of each of these mimics the electron configuration of a noble gas. This is neon's configuration. This is helium's. But that makes sense because they become stable, and since noble gases are always stable, they're going to mimic their electron configuration. Also notice how 
oxygen and lithium, even though they both have two energy levels and they're both in the same row, doesn't oxygen look smaller? That's because atomic radius increases as we go this way on the table and down. Why is that? Why is it even though they have the same two, two energy levels that this one is smaller? Because this has a greater nuclear pull because it's got more protons, so it's pulling that energy level, that last energy level, in tighter. Now, atomic radius for oxygen is bigger and lithium is smaller because it trends from left, well, it turned, it's anti-right, which means it goes to the left, increases this way and down. Now, these other three periodic trends trend in the opposite direction. They trend up the table and over. Now, all three of these trends, ionization energy, electron negativity, and electron affinity, have to do with keeping and attracting electrons. Wouldn't it make sense that this upper corner where oxygen is, is where they try to gain, attract electrons, so it increases that way. So, in the case of ionization, electron affinity, and electronegativity, oxygen is higher in every case, and this is lower, lithium is lower in every case. So, periodic trends is also another thing about the periodic table and each individual element. It's something that we can draw just by looking at this, we can draw information from it. Now, as promised, between each scene, since we're done with scene one, Victor is going to provide you some entertainment. Look, I got enemies, got a lot of enemies, got a lot of people trying to drain me of my energy. I'm doing your mom So, your mom is so ugly that she even made Hello Little Kitty say goodbye. Now we begin scene two. We are still dealing with the same chemical reaction. We're going to do this through all five scenes because I just want to show you how chemistry can relate to so many different topics and only deal with one chemical reaction. Now, we're going to talk about each one of these substances within the reaction. There's lithium, there's H2O, which is water, lithium hydroxide, which is a solution, we mentioned that earlier, and then hydrogen gas. Now, this lithium is what we call a lone free element. It's unstable, okay? There's only some elements that can actually be by themselves and be stable. The noble gases in particular. Now, hydrogen, or excuse me, water, H2O, is covalently bonded. How do we know? It's a non-metal and a non-metal. Now, covalent bonded compounds are typically called molecules, so we call this a molecule of water. They are sharing electrons. That's what a covalent bond, that's the definition of it, basically. Now, lithium hydroxide, this is a metal and a polyatomic ion. When you've got three different elements, we call this a tertiary compound, that indicates that I've most likely got a metal, some sort of cation with a polyatomic ion, which is typically an anion. So this is lithium, and then this is OH, this is hydroxide. Now, this is the cation, like I said, and this is the anion. One loses, and then the polyatomic ion gains an electron. Now, right here is hydrogen gas, and there's a two subscript on hydrogen because it's one of seven nonmetals that forms diatomically when alone. The other ones are nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine. Now, so covalent bonding is sharing electrons. Ionic bonding is losing and gaining. It's an exchange of electrons for stability. And then, um, and, I, and over here, we've also got, even with the diatomic molecule, they are still sharing. Now, one thing I want to mention is how I've labeled this is polar covalent, and this is nonpolar covalent. How do we know that this is polar. How is it that I can say that electrons are shared unequally here, but equally here? So why is it that they're not sharing electrons equally? I think polar and nonpolar are different because oxygen is better looking than a hydrogen. Duh. This stuff's easy. Okay. So it really is because oxygen is more attractive than hydrogen. If you recall in our periodic trends, that because oxygen is over here on the table and hydrogen is way over here, oxygen is much more electronegative. It's closer to fluorine. However, they're alike enough to still shear electrons. They're both nonmetals, but oxygen is more attractive. So what ends up happening is the electrons are shared unequally. Now, also, if you recall, that there was instances where you can technically tell that it's polar versus nonpolar. The electronegative value of oxygen is 3.5 and hydrogen is 2.1, which is a difference of 1.4. That is different enough to fall in the polar region. 
Now, over here, when you've got two hydrogens, this one's 2.1 and this is 2.1, that's a difference of zero. There is no difference in the way that they attract electrons, so they share equally. Now, in addition, there are some things that we can actually say that are special in regards to covalent bonds because they create molecules and because molecules share it's not like here here's your electrons I'm going to give them to you and you've gained them now they have to share so they have to stay together now because of something called the Vesper theory which is valence shell electron pair repulsion the atoms in a molecule will take on certain orientations in space well in order to define this orientation or this geometry you have to draw out the Lewis dot structure so if we take water you first need to count up how many valence electrons total you have. Hydrogen 1, hydrogen 1, oxygen 6. So that's a total of 8 valence electrons. Now oxygen will be my central atom, and hydrogen will be on the outside. I need to make sure I pair them up to the outer atoms, and then that's 1, 2, 3, 4, so I've got 4 more to use, so we're going to go ahead and finish the octet, octet around oxygen. Now hydrogen only needs 2 to be stable, so they're good like this. Now, so this is the Lewis dot structure. What is the molecular geometry? Well, let's classify it. This is A, B2, and then there's two lone pairs, so that's E2. An AB2E2 molecule is known as bent. That's because these two atoms are going to draw downward because they're trying to repel these negative charges, these lone pairs that are a little bit more repulsive that are on the outside, or still surrounding the central atom. So there ends up being this partial negative charge here and a partial positive charge on the hydrogens because of oxygen unequally sharing the electrons. Now, another thing I want to mention is these intermolecular forces. We did talk about these this year um, when we talked about bonding. Now, intermolecular forces are like bonds, but they're not quite as strong. There's hydrogen bonding, dipole-dipole, and London dispersion forces. Now, London dispersion forces are very, very weak, but dipole-dipole forces, or hydrogen bonding, which are essentially the same thing, is when there's a partial negative charge and partial positive in polar bonds. What ends up happening is in the neighbor water neighboring water molecule that the hydrogen with the partial positive charge is going to have this slight attraction with the hydrogen on a neighboring molecule. And so because of that, they call this a dipole-dipole force. And in this case of water, you can actually call it hydrogen bonding because it involves hydrogen. Now, speaking of hydrogen, we're going to move over here and switch gears for just one more second because we want to finish up this scene. LiOH is actually a base. And I went over this at the very end of class and we talked about why is that. It's because of the hydroxide ion. Bases release hydroxide ions whenever in a reaction, okay? So this is what they will release when they become neutralized. Now, if you recall also, acids begin with hydrogen on the front end, acting as a cation. So this right here and this right here, these are both acids. This is kind of called hydrochloric acid, and this is sulfuric acid, because acids will actually release hydrogen, which they call hydronium ions, whenever they are released in a neutralization reaction. Okay, so that concludes scene two, and we're about to move on to scene three. So we're between scenes. You know what that means. That's about how they gonna run up on me. We'll run up when you see me, then we gonna see. Updating my wardrobe. And yes, I'm doing another Yo Mama joke. So Yo Mama is so short that and you can see your legs on her driver's license. So, early in the movie, we balanced this chemical equation. Why did we do that? Well, because according to the law of conservation of mass, matter cannot be created or des destroyed. It's just transformed. It is conserved. Now, another way of looking at this is that it means that for every two atoms of lithium, you're going to have to add two molecules of water in order to produce two um, units of an LiOH compound and one molecule of hydrogen gas. But this is way too small for our world. We can't put one little atom, two little atoms, put them with two little molecules. We really can't talk about the tiny world of these little particles. So, how do we relate to it? The mole. What is the mole, Victor? A little tiny mouse? No. 
I mean, not that's not what we're talking about. Yeah, it is something that lives under the ground. It is kind of like a mouse, but that's not what we're talking about. Is it also blind? Yes, but that doesn't matter. Okay, so the mole is actually something that connects our world in terms of measuring amounts of substance to the tiny world of atoms and molecules. And one mole of any pure substance is equal to 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. So if I've got one mole of hydrogen gas, then I've got 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd hydrogen molecules. Now, we can use the concept of the mole and a balanced equation to do something or to involve ourselves in a process known as stoichiometry. Now, say for instance that I have that I have 28 grams of lithium. Well, that's cool. We use grams to measure mass in the lab. This is relevant to us. But how on earth do I use this to relate to this? Here's how. The mole not only connects the tiny world of particles to a mole, but the mole is how we relate to grams using the molar mass. Lithium has a molar mass that is, according to the periodic table, its mass is rounds up to 7. So that means that lithium's molar mass is 7 grams per 1 mole. Okay? So we can use this concept to actually convert out of grams and go into moles. 1 mole is 7 grams, so I can solve for the moles of lithium by doing this dimensional analysis setup using the molar mass of lithium. And so this is 4 moles of lithium. What else does this mean? Well, if we have it in moles, I can now figure out how many of those tiny particles I actually have. So I can say that 4 moles of lithium contains a total of 4 times 6 0.02 times 10 to the 23rd, which is going to be a really, really big number. Now, I do have to put this in parentheses in my calculator in order for it to solve correctly. And when I do that, it gives me 2.41 times 10 to the 24th. And since we're talking about just an individual element, just an atom, that's 2.41 times 10 to the 24th atoms. So, 2.41 times 10 to the 24th atoms is equal to 4 moles of lithium, which is equivalent to 28 grams of lithium. So this is our world, this is the tiny world of particles, and the mole is what links the two. Now, we can also use the concept of stoichiometry to convert between different chemical substances. Just now, I was really just analyzing one chemical substance, lithium, how I can switch or convert between grams, moles, and atoms for that particular substance. But you can actually take this 28 grams of lithium and say, I added 28 grams of lithium with plenty of water present. How much LiOH did I form in moles? It's a gram to mole problem. So, how do you do that? I can take 28 grams of lithium. I can get out of my grams of lithium, and I have to get it in moles. Moles is what links us to the world of tiny particles. And it also is the only way that I can switch between two chemical substances. This is called a mole-mole ratio. So if I have grams of lithium and I'm looking for, say, moles of hydrogen gas, I can do that by getting out of grams of lithium, going to moles of lithium, getting out of moles of lithium, and doing a molar ratio into hydrogen gas. Now, in order to do this, now I'm going to go ahead and plug in the molar mass for lithium. I need to look at the balanced equation, because this equation is what allows me to switch between chemical substances. It relates them. There are two of these for every one of these. So when I do this and I solve for my moles of hydrogen gas, I get two moles of hydrogen gas. So, voila! Stoichiometry is a concept where we can convert between different substances by using grams and moles and conversion factors of molar mass and a molar ratio. There are a couple more advanced ideas in stoichiometry that I want to cover as well. 
Those two things are the idea of a limiting versus an excess reactant. That is, which of my two ingredients are holding me back from creating more product? And then with that limiting reactant, however much it allows us to produce, we can use that amount that the limiting reactant allowed us to produce and call it our theoretical yield. In theory, that's how much we should produce. We can take that theoretical yield with an actual yield that is measured and collected in the lab and figure out our percent yield. And then we can also further that by repeating our experiment and then looking at the data and talking about something called accuracy and precision. So let's take an example problem. Let's deal with that same 28 grams of lithium. Okay, so let's say that you've got the 28 grams of lithium and you mix the 28 grams of lithium with, say, 40 grams of water. Okay, so this is what our reactants are. We want to know which one of these two ingredients is limiting us from creating the most product. Now, we've got two products, but you can choose one to convert to with stoichiometry, but make sure you convert to that with both of your reactants. So we can start out by saying I've got 28 grams of lithium, and let's use the LiOH, okay? So we're going to, because the LiOH is actually going to be in solution form and we can collect it a little easier than the hydrogen gas which can escape. So we're going to get out of grams of lithium and go into moles of lithium. You always want to go to the mole if you start out in mass because that will allow you to switch to your new substance which we decide we're going to convert over to LiOH. Now I'm going to use the molar ratio, mole to mole, to get out of lithium and go into LiOH. Now, I'm not going to stop at just the moles of LiOH because I know that I'm going to solve for theoretical and actual yield. And in terms of the lab, we need it in mass because that's something that we use. We use grams. So let's go a step further and get out of moles of LiOH and make this a full gram to gram stoichiometry problem. So I'm going to go ahead. One mole of this weighs 7 grams. The ratio of this is 2 to 2, so that's really a ratio of 1. And then the one mole of LiOH, 7 plus 16 plus 1 is 24 grams. Now, let's make sure that we cross out the units that cancel mathematically. And then so 28 grams of lithium, in theory, should produce 96 grams of lithium hydroxide. Okay? Now, that's how much it can produce in theory. Let's see how much in theory the 40 grams. That is, if we have the if we have the Li and we add and we add it to this 40 grams, how many can the 40 grams? How much can it produce potentially? So we're going to use its molar mass. Water is 18 grams per mole. Get out of moles of water. Switch to the other substance, which again we are going to focus on one product, with this, which is the lithium hydroxide. And it is a 2 to 2 as well. And get out of moles of it and switch to grams so it's a little bit more applicable in our terms. So when you do the math on this and then your units mathematically do cancel, we are going to get a total of LiOH produced by, what is going out? 52.8 grams. So, we can look at the amount of product that each one of these can potentially, in theory, form, and we can see that this reactant, water, is our limiting reactant. That is, it is limiting, water is limiting us from producing more. So, more of the LiOH. So, this is all we're going to be able to produce in theory. So let's say that I do this experiment and that um, I collect the LiOH from the reaction and I go and I let it dry out and I go to um, the scale and I measure it and I measure out that I actually collected in the lab, I actually collected, and again this is something they'll give to you in a problem, it'll say Susie, Bob, whatever, collected this much in the experiment, so it's what they actually measured and collected. So let's say I actually collected 46.4 grams of LiOH. This is called the actual yield. Now up here, I already solved for the theoretical yield. This is not my theoretical yield because I can't even get to this value. I'm limited to only producing this much. But in theory, that's how much you could produce with 28 grams of this and 40 grams of this. So when I do this, of course these cancel out because this is really just a percent that we're looking for. 46.4 divided by my theoretical yield 
And then you've got to um, multiply this by 100, and that will give me around 87.9% yield. So what happened to the other 12.1%? Well, no experiment is perfect, and that's why we have what we call a theoretical yield. Because in theory, in a perfect world, you would produce that much, but we never get that close. So 87.9% um, yield, and what we would call the other 12.1% out of 100 that's missing is our error. That's our percent error, okay? So lastly, and this is something that's applicable to anywhere where you collect data, but let's say that I collected 46.4 the first time in this experiment, but let's say that I went ahead and I repeated this experiment, and let's say I got 46.3 grams the second time, and then I got on the last time that I did this experiment, so a total of three times I did this experiment, I got 46.4 grams, then 46.3, and 46.2. This would mean that my data is very precise. However, is it accurate? Well, no, it's not, because we said that the theoretical yield we calculated is 52.8. This is what it should be, okay? This is what's correct. So although my data is precise, it is not accurate. We just finished scene three. Now it's time for scene four. Do your thing. Hello. I'm doing another Your Mama joke. And this one is fat. Your mama's so fat, her belly button beat her own. Okay, so we've completed stoichiometry, and stoichiometry allows us to compare different amounts of substances, and we can use moles and grams and that sort of thing, but moles and grams are present in this entire equation. Um, but one thing that we have to notice is when something is in solution form, that means that some chemical has been dissolved most of the time in water, because water is the universal solvent. So, it's not just a solid liquid or gas, so it has a concentration because it's actually a solid or something that has solute that has been dissolved in a solvent, okay? So because of this, it has a concentration. The concentration can be, and the solubility curve for any given substance looks different, but let's just say for the LiOH that this was its solubility curve. This would be a perfectly saturated solution. It's got just the right amount of solute and solvent to be perfectly dissolved. Now, this would be our super saturated zone, and this would be the unsaturated zone below the solubility curve. So if you see one of those, that's really what it's talking about. Now, it has to do with a weak, a just right, and then a really strong concentrated substance. Now, these are two ways of measuring, two different ways of measuring concentration. There is molarity and molality. Molarity is the more commonly used one. Um, but molarity refers to how many moles of solute, which we learned that a mole is relevant to grams of a substance, but how many moles of solute um, for a chemical are there in the entire solution? So this is the whole versus the part. Now, molality is where you take the moles of the solute and you compare it to how much of the solvent in kilograms that you used. So let's say that we produced 500 milliliters of LiOH and it has a 2.65 molar concentration um, and it asks us how many moles was actually used in this particular solution. Well you could take the molarity and plug it in. This is big M and then 500 milliliters, this has to be in liters, so you have to make a quick conversion to take this out of milliliters, go into liters, there's a thousand of these for every one of these, which means that we're going to go three decimal places back, so it's 0.5 liters. So we're going to point, plug in 0.5 liters over here, and you can kind of think of this as your x, okay, your unknown variable that you're solving for. So we're going to cross multiply, and so x, which is our moles of solute, is going to be 0.5 times 2.65. Now when you multiply these, you're going to get 1.175 moles of LiOH. That's how many moles are contained in this solution. Now, moles don't mean anything to anyone outside of this chemistry classroom, so when someone says, moles, they're going to go, what do you mean? How does that relate to me? In other words, how do you put this in grams? Well, that's where you would just take this 
And since it's in moles, just use the molar mass of LiOH. And if somebody wants to know how this is relevant to them, say, oh, well, this solution, and since this is 24, we're going to multiply using dimensional analysis. So 1.175 times the 24 grams is 28.2 grams of LiOH. So now this can seem more relevant and make more sense to someone outside of our classroom if you tell them, oh, well, the solution had 28.2 grams of LiOH inside of it, as opposed to saying moles, which is something that we understand, but someone else may not. Now, other things that we can take from the molarity and molality stuff other than it being saturated, unsaturated, supersaturated. You can also think about, and this is something that I didn't have time to really touch on in class, but you can think about how you can dilute something. When you dilute something, you make it weaker, okay? So it falls be below the saturation point. So what happens if I added, let's say that I had the 500 milliliter solution and I upped it to 1,500 milliliters, okay? So I upped it by 1,000 milliliters. And let's say I don't add any more solute. So that means the concentration is still 2.65 molars. Can you tell me what is the new concentration? How would we set this up? Well, if the moles remains constant, the moles of solid, that is we don't add any more of the LiOH. Let's say there's not any more in there. And we just, we basically change the volume of solution. We can kind of eliminate this. And you can see that when you multiply these, it's almost like you have the beginning molarity and the beginning volume. And then you've got an ending, which is basically what we're looking for, an ending molarity, an ending concentration, and then you've got your new volume, okay? So I basically set up this formula to where I can see what occurs whenever I dilute the concentration, what does it do, or to, excuse me, add more fluid, that is, add more solvent water to dilute this. So if I plug these in, I'm going to make this liters just to stay consistent. And then this is 2.65, and I basically adjusted it up to 1,500. I'm looking for the new concentration, the new molarity. How concentrated is it now? And then this is 1.5 liters. When I do this, I'm going to divide, I'm going to multiply this, and then I'm going to divide both sides by this, okay, once I divide these. And so the new concentration should be weaker because I added more water. I'm therefore diluting it. So this was my beginning concentration, and so my new concentration is going to be 0.88. Makes sense, right? When you add more water to a solution, then it makes it weaker. And now I could probably presume that this is unsaturated if this was considered saturated. <laughs> So, I'm going to say a really deep and dark secret. Oh, wait, no, nope, I'm awesome here. Sorry, I got to say no to y'all mama, Jake. Sorry. Y'all mama is so old. Her first Christmas was the first Christmas. You will recall in this reaction that we actually produced a gas. Gases are unique. Gases are unique since they have no definite shape or volume. So in order to study them, we have gas laws in place that allows us to predict um, what can happen or what changes will occur in variables. And we can also figure out what sort of conditions are present for a particular amount of a gas in moles. So each one of these laws, there's the ideal gas law and the combined gas law. They are here to help us study gases. Now, a combined gas law will allow you to predict behaviors based on before and after conditions. So if I know a beginning pressure, volume, and temperature, but I only know the ending pressure and volume, I can plug all those givens, five out of the six in, and solve for the ending temperature. So I can do this for any one of these six variables if I know the other five. Now let's just say that they say that volume remained constant throughout in the reaction. That means that, or in the change, you could remove volume from both sides of the equation and just solve for pressure over temperature. So that is the combined gas law, and it is when we're predicting behaviors based on before and after conditions. Now, it's important to know that in either one of these, that your temperature has to be in kelvins. Now, kelvins is always the larger unit. 273 kelvins is equal to zero degrees Celsius. So, also, pressure units, there's so many of them. And this is actually on your reference page right here. It's got the different units for pressure on it. 
But pressure units, one atmosphere is the same as 760 millimeters of mercury, which is the same as 760 tors, which is the same as 101.3 kilopascals, which is the same as 14.7 psi. So all of these are equivalent. Now, STP, if you ever see STP, if it tells you that the reaction occurred at STP, it refers to a given pressure, which is one atmosphere, and a given temperature of 273 Kelvin. So always keep that in mind. Now, the ideal gas law is specifically set up for when conditions aren't changing, like over here. It's when the conditions, ideally, if they were constant, what the moles of the gas, what kind of pressure, volume, and temperature would be present. Now, there is an R value, which is called the universal gas constant. And the gas constant, which is a given, it's also over here in your constants. The one that you use depends on if your pressure that is given is in atmosphere or if it's in kilopascals. So if it gives you the pressure in atmosphere, you're going to plug that in for your R value. Now, solving for gas laws doesn't just stop here. There will be questions, and the big picture questions are actually applying stoichiometry with gas laws. So let's say, for instance, that we have, it tells us that 40 grams of water was used in this reaction, okay, and it created um, a certain amount of both of these, okay, but if we used 40 grams of water, then what volume would the hydrogen gas occupy if this reaction occurred at STP? So, wait a minute. You're telling me that I need to figure out the volume of this gas, that, how much volume, what liters of hydrogen gas we made, based on an amount of water that we started with, we can do this. The ideal gas law incorporates moles. And we learned in stoichiometry just a few minutes ago in the video that we can take mass of one thing, grams, and figure out moles of something else. So let's do that. If we take, and we're saying this happened at STP, so if we take these 40 grams of H2O, let's go ahead and switch over to our new substance that we're trying to solve for. And particularly, we're going to do a gram to mole problem because moles is what is incorporated into the gas law. So I'm going to get out of grams, that's 18 grams of H2O for every one mole of H2O. Now, now that I'm in moles, I can officially switch from mole to mole in a mole ratio. Looking up at my balanced equation, this is, there's two of these for every one H2 molecule. So now that we are in moles, okay, so when we plug all this in, we end up getting around 1.1 repeating moles. Around one mole of hydrogen gas should form, if we started with 40 grams of water, that's how many moles of hydrogen gas should be produced. We can take this and determine what volume, if we were to be able to capture all that gas, how much, how many liters it would be. So pressure, now it's in STP, which means that pressure is one atmosphere, and volume is my unknown, and we just saw for it, number of moles of H2, around one, so we'll put the 1.1 just to remain precise, and because this is in atmospheres, STP stands for atmospheres of pressure, we're going to use the 0 .0821 gas constant, and then times the standard temperature, which is 273, and it's that at 3 up, kelvins. Now, when you solve for all this, 1 times V is just V. When you get this, you're going to get around 24.65 liters of hydrogen gas. That's how much space the hydrogen gas that forms would occupy. Now, another way that you can do this is using, this is also in your reference sheet. There is something, and this may blur on us, but there is something known as molar volume at STP. Because we are at STP, we can actually use this. There are 22.4 liters per mole of any gas. So if we've got roughly one mole of hydrogen gas, that's roughly 22.4 liters, which you can see there is a slight difference. So if you really wanted to be as specific as possible, you could put it in the ideal gas law. Okay, so I'm just going to spend a couple more minutes going over some key ideas that I need to wrap up. One thing that I didn't mention with the gas law is that you need to understand that pressure and volume are inversely related. When you, in, when you increase volume, that means you get more particle, a uh, more particle room, more space for the particles to roam. So if you increase volume, that decreases the pressure. They are inversely related. Okay? Now, 
However, pressure and volume both have a direct relationship with temperature. So let's say that temperature increases, gets real hot, okay? Pressure increases always. Temperature gets real hot, the volume expands for a balloon. That's why they pop when you go from a cold location like inside a roof or an air conditioned um, store to going outside where it's really hot. So these are directly proportional. Some other things that we mentioned is the phase diagrams. Don't forget that um, these are all basically the same template, but this is solid, liquid, and gas. And it basically shows you the different phases. This is where solid to liquid phase, liquid to gas, and then gas to solid. And these all have a name. This is gas to solid to deposition. This is sublimation. If you add energy, solid to a liquid, it's going to melt. If you take away energy, that means that you're going to go back and freeze. Liquid to gas is boiling, but gas to liquid is condensation, like the dew on the grass in the morning. So this is a phase diagram. Let's not forget about those. Other things that we want to think about are significant figures. Remember that with sig figs, there's only two times you don't count them as significant. That is, if they are just placeholder zeros, there's no decimal present. These are trailing with no decimal present. The other time you don't count them is if they are leading zeros, okay? So... And it doesn't mean that they're not important. They're just not significant when we talk about precision. So these are not significant. These are not significant. Any other time you will count the zeros. Now, um, what else? Scientific notation, be sure that you always have a coefficient that is between 1 and 9. So, for instance, this can never be, this always has to be in the 1's place. It cannot be bigger or smaller. This is a number that is much, much smaller, so that means we go back to put it in standard form. If it was 1.2 times 10 to the 11th positive, that means it's a much, much bigger, and we go 11 that way. So scientific notation allows us to make really, really big and really, really small numbers more condensed and easier to use. Now, another thing that we want to mention is solids, liquids, and gases also don't forget the idea that if you take energy away, that means that you're slowing the particles down, thus going more to a solid state and that bonds are forming, and that the opposite is true if you're adding energy, that bonds are um, being broken, and that kinetic energy is increasing, the particles are moving faster. Which brings me to the idea of exothermic and endothermic. Don't forget, it's exothermic when you're Reactants start out high, but then they end low. That means that energy has left. It is exited or escaped. All right? And then if your reactants start out low, but then we've got high at the end, that is reactants start here, and then the products are higher than the reactants. That means that it's an endo. That means that energy came in. Okay, so there's just some extra little things that I want to mention other than that, and I think that we are completely done. Um, this is not every single thing, but it's a lot of the stuff that we've covered this year. Take the time to revisit this video. I'll make it available to you guys if you would like to look at it again just to be prepared for tomorrow. Good luck. I know you're doing awesome. Goodbye. Do good on your test. Bye. Doofies.